Hey, Gateway, thank you so much for joining us online this morning. Each week we have our choir and orchestra service at 8.30. We have our kids service at 9.45. And we have our worship band at 10.30. Please take a moment and fill out a connection card online. You know, this morning we're also going to celebrate communion together. And so I want to encourage you to go grab your elements if you haven't done that yet. And you know, Gateway has started Gateway Anywhere, which means we're meeting online, the service you're watching right now. But we're also meeting on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. in person in our South parking lot. And last week we got to celebrate baptism. So I wore my baptism shirt uh, because we want to share with you uh, that celebration of baptism. So take a look at this video from last Sunday. Yeah. Emily is 40 years old. She's accepted Christ into her, her life. And she says that Jesus helps her get through everything in life and that he's always there for her. And she can pray to him whenever she needs help. So that is awesome, Emily. And Bill Yoshimoto is going to baptize you this morning. Well, good morning, Gateway. Hey, we've been waiting a long time for this. And Emily, I know you've been waiting a long time to be baptized. You wanted to be baptized in front of your church family and your regular family. I know I gave you the opportunity to be baptized in my swimming pool, but you said, no, you want to do it in front of all of us here at Gateway Church. Absolutely. So Emily, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Yes. Do you promise to the best of your abilities and with the help of the Holy Spirit to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Well, step on in. Okay, go ahead and kneel down. And on your profession of faith, Emily, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There we go, all right. You know, God continues to bless Gateway with amazing ways as we reach out to our community. And our Vision 2020 campaign is well underway. In fact, they started pouring concrete this week. So we are excited to see what the future holds as we plan for the ways that Gateway is going to continue to reach out to the Visalia community and beyond. And you know, people need to know about the hope that we have in Christ. And one of the ways you can do that is by sharing this. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook right now, would you just share uh, this worship service with others so that they can see the hope that we have in Christ? And we know that you're looking for ways to connect during this time. So check out Fall at Gateway on our website. We have groups for all ages. We have financial accountability. We have dealing with grief and other support and care groups. And we also have our online Zoom small groups. You know, we want to thank you too for your continued generosity and faithfulness and tithing. And you can continue to do that on our website at gatewayvisalia.com. You can give in person at our outdoor service, or you can bring your tithe into the church office. Gateway, let's prepare our hearts this morning as we worship and let's give him all the glory. Good morning and welcome to Gateway. I'm Guy. Hi, Guy. Glad that you've joined us online this morning. Uh, just sit back and let's let's worship God. Two, three, and come. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give. Just as 
You know, we've come to the time in our service where we get to celebrate communion together. And it reminds me of this uh, time in my childhood when I was probably about five or six years old. And uh, my family had a dear friend that had passed away. They lived at the coast. And so uh, we were going to attend a celebration of life. And uh, I remember going there with my parents. We had to pack up the car. We had to travel um, to the coast and uh, spend a night in a hotel. And then we went to this celebration service. And one of the uh, requirements was that no one at this service was to wear black because this person wanted to be celebrated. They wanted their life celebrated and they wanted um, the people to be joyous uh, because they were a believer and they didn't want people to mourn. And so sometimes whenever uh, we take communion, I think it's great for it to be a somber and, uh, and uh, an honoring uh, type event. But I think also as Christians, as believers, we need to remember that this also is a celebration of the life of the mercy of the grace that we have in Christ Jesus. And so I wanna encourage you this morning as you uh, partake in communion, uh, that you would also just have a, an air of celebration. Uh, we we'll remember the sacrifice and the death that Christ uh, gave us on the cross. And, uh, and that can be a somber thing, but we also wanna celebrate the life and the joy that we have in him. And in 1 Corinthians, it says this in chapter 11. Uh, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so church, this morning, we have an opportunity to proclaim the Lord's death, to remember what he did on that cross together. So I wanna invite you to spend some time this morning um, and reflect on the cross, reflect on what Jesus means to you. And then as our worship teams lead you in this next song, go ahead and take the elements and uh, pray at the end. Oh, Jesus, it's so hard to imagine so hard to comprehend but you were the word at the beginning one with god the lord most high your
Gateway, we're glad you're with us this morning as we're in our series from the book of First Peter. Hope during troubled times. That's what we really need. Hey, listen, how many of you remember your first car? Well, some of you may have your first car. I don't know. But how many of you remember your first car? If you remember your first car, turn to the person next to you and tell them what it was and, and have a good laugh. You know, my first car was a Corvair. Uh, it was a 1964 uh, Corvair. Corvair was a, I'm going to teach you a new word this morning, portmanteau. Corvair was a portmanteau because it was a combination, you're not going to believe this, the word Corvair was a combination word of a Corvette, really, <laughs> and a Bel Air because it had an air-cooled engine. A, a Corvair had an air-cooled engine, so they combined those two words uh, because they wanted to make a small, compact car. Chevy wanted to make a small, compact car, and it was called the Poor Man's Porsche, which was perfect for me because I was poor and I had a Corvair, so it worked out really well. But when the Corvair was brought out in 1960, Ed Cole was the chief engineer, and he was on the cover of Time Magazine, the biggest magazine in the world at the time, and Ed Cole, who had engineered the Corvair, was on the cover of that, and uh, it won the Motor Trend Car of the Year Award in 1960, and qu I quote from Motor Trend, this, this introduces a new era of engineering in Detroit. And that's what the Corvair was. And it, it had independent suspension on all four wheels, which made it corner really, really well. But, he ha but it had a big problem. It had a big problem. And a man by the name of Ralph Nader wrote a book uh, called Unsafe at Any Speed, and it destroyed the Corvair. 
Uh, Ralph Nader had two problems though. Ralph Nader had no degree in mechanical engineering or any other kind of engineering. And the second problem Ralph Nader had is that he didn't even have a driver's license. He had no driver's license, but he wrote this book about the Corvair, unsafe at any speed. And he said, you go around corners at any speed, the Corvair will just flip over uh, onto its top. And so a man by the name of Tom uh, McCahill, he was a reviewer for Mechanics Illustrated magazine. He, he strapped on his helmet, he strapped on his seatbelt, he took several Corvairs out and various speeds tried, tried his best to flip them. And the best he could do is get the Corvair to slide. I drove a Corvair, they drove great, they had great cornering. Uh, but Ralph Nader destroyed it. Tom McCahill said he could get a Volkswagen Bug to flip over easier than the Corvair, yet the Volkswagen Bug sold millions and millions and they destroyed the Corvair. Now the Corvair did have a big huge problem, but it really wasn't flipping over. Uh, the Corvair was a rear engine car. It was an air-cooled car and they put the fan for the engine, because every engine has to have a fan, they put the fan for the Corvair engine on the top of the engine. And the Corvair's main problem is it had a bad main seal. The main seal on the engine compartment was bad and it would blow and it would leak oil everywhere. And because that fan was on top of the engine, it would suck that oil from the engine up in the fan and it would sling it all over the engine compartment. And you could see Corvairs driving down the road. They had a little chrome piece at the back and it'd have oil on it. And there'd be smoke billowing out of the Corvair because it would sling oil. The engine would heat it up. They would smoke like crazy. But the problem was you didn't know the Corvair had a problem until it was too late. Uh, that main seal would blow, engine uh, oil would go all over the engine, smoke would billow out of that. And the problem wasn't external. It wasn't independent suspension and flipping over unsafe at any speed. It was internal. It was that main seal on the engine was the problem. Uh, it didn't have integrity. Uh, the engine had a big problem and it didn't have integrity. And by the time you saw it on the outside, it was too late, everything was already over. And it's just a really good analogy and a really good illustration and example of what happens to us. Sometimes we lack integrity. Uh, sometimes what we look like on the outside is really not what we are on the inside, inside. And sometimes that main seal on our life blows and all of a sudden everybody sees what's going on uh, internally. And Peter wants to discuss internal integrity with us today. He wants to talk about in 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. We're just going to take two verses today. In those two verses, he wants to talk about internal integrity. And he starts with this verse, verse 11. Dear friends. Now, that's a very anemic translation of this word. Other translations translate it beloved, but it's a word with a ton of intensity. It's like Peter is saying to these people, you're the people that I love. I, I, I intensely want you to know this. I, I want to make sure you understand. Beloved, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world, nowhere else in the whole New Testament does anyone put these two words together. But but Peter is so intensely interested in the integrity of the people he's talking to, the people that he loves. He calls them beloved. And he says, I want to remind you who you are. You are aliens and strangers in this world. He uses this intense word to say you are deeply loved by God. And then he uses this two word combination to say, I want you to intensely realize you are not a part of this world. You are not a part of what's going on. You are aliens and strangers in this world and you need to understand that you need to abstain from sinful desires, which just means passions. And, and these passions that Peter 
is talking about are negative passions, but this word passion can be used for positive things too. Oftentimes we ask people, hey, what's your passion? I love art, I love music, I love academics, I love mechanics, I love, you know, and we have a passion for things we're gifted at. And so Peter is using a very intense word as well, you know, do not let sinful passions or desires because they war against your soul. And this word war is strateo. We get our English word strategic. Uh, these sinful passions uh, are being strategically used by Satan in the world to attack uh, who you are. And you know, Peter and all of these people that he's talking to, they understand war. They live in the Roman Empire. They totally understand a war. Uh, there's a classic book by a man that was written years ago Will Durant wrote this book, uh, Caesar and Christ, and it's a classic book. Every Bible student uh, read this book when I was in seminary. You read this book because it was so filled with the uh, fundamentals of the Roman Empire and, and what it was like to live under the authority of Caesar, and Will Durant pens these words. The Roman Empire was the greatest military machine of the ancient world. And he was 100% correct. Uh, they created the greatest military machine that any empire and the world had ever seen before. Uh, Polybius in uh, 225 BC, 200 years before Christ, Polybius says that the Roman Empire could muster 700,000 infantry and 70,000 cavalry. Why? Because every Roman... Uh, was a part of that military. Every able-bodied man, uh, till they were 30 years old, served in the military, and then uh, they were in reserve for an extra 14 years. So until they were 44 years old, they served in the military. To get into the military and be a in the Roman army, which every man in the Roman Empire wanted to be because there were some great benefits to it, uh, you had to be able to march 20 miles a day, carrying a 60-pound backpack, and that backpack had include your armor. You had to carry 60 pounds. And uh, then you had to be able to go at fast pace, 24 miles in a day when they did double time. And you were also trained in gymnastics. You were trained in swimming. You did all of this conditioning. And when you were successful at uh, completing all of that training, you got a diploma and you carried that diploma, it was a badge of honor. You had that diploma and you had an enlistment in the Roman army. Your goal was to serve, especially if you were not a citizen, if you were not a citizen of Rome, your goal was to serve 25 years in the Roman military because if you could complete that, then you were given citizenry and oftentimes you were sent to a new area that Rome wanted to colonize and you would receive free land you would uh, be uh, named a governor or someone in the government of that new city. And if you became a citizen, you paid no taxes. How many of us want to be Roman citizens? All of us, because you paid no taxes. The key to the success of the Roman Empire militarily was the numbers that they could mobilize, 700,000 men. See, even if they lost the battle, they could win the war because they could outlast the enemy. No other empire in the ancient world, uh, no other uh, you know, nation, so to speak, because Germany wasn't a nation, it was just a bunch of tribes. Nobody could muster uh, the kind of military power and prowess uh, of the Roman Empire. So even if they lost a battle, they could win the war and they could get there fast. The Romans built roads, 50 57,000 miles of roads all over their empire. So if there was a revolution or an uprising, uh, they could get their legion of men to that place, quell the whole thing and put it down. And it was the key to their uh, success. And they had different kinds of tactics uh, that they would use. They borrowed tactics from from Philip of Macedon, Alexander the Great's father. They Julius Caesar borrowed tactics from... Uh, uh, from uh, the uh, Egyptians, and, and they borrowed tactics from Hannibal uh, when he tried to invade 
the Roman Empire. Uh, I mean, they adjusted and they were flexible and they fought battles in different kinds of ways. And when Peter says, abstain from the tactics and the strategies of Satan that wage war against your soul. Uh, your soul is tied to the soul of Jesus. And, and the tactics of God and of Jesus Christ given to us by the Holy Spirit are different than the tactics of the world. The Roman Empire was brutal. Uh, the Roman Empire looked at grace and mercy as weakness. Uh, they were all about military power and exerting that power and making sure that the rest of the world knew they were subject to that power of Rome. And when Jesus came, he used an entirely different set of tactics. And so when Peter says, hey, you need to absorb not the tactics of the world. Those tactics war against your soul. You need to absorb uh, what Jesus Christ wants to do in your life. So verse 12 is a contrast to verse 11. In verse 12, Peter writes this, Live such good lives among the pagans, those who are following the strategy and tactics of Satan, that the result would be so that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll realize you're not and they'll see your good deeds and glorify God, even the non-Christians, the non-believers, those that aren't following Jesus Christ, even those people will glorify God on the day he visits us. Because they will see your good works and your good deeds and they'll go, wow, these people are different. Now, the way they handle adversity, the way they handle their enemies, the way they handle people is entirely different than the Roman Empire and the Romans. In fact, he uses this word good twice in this verse. In verse 12, notice that. They'll see your good lives and, lives and they'll see your good deeds, demonstrations. Uh, but there's two different words for the word good in the New Testament. Uh, there's the word agathos, which means beneficially good deeds. It, it, it means that they are beneficial to other people uh, but that's, that's not the word that Peter uses here. He uses the word kalos, which means intrinsically good. It means uh, noble intrinsic actions. It means uh, actions that are honorable, that are absorbed internally. And there's this integrity, what's going on inside in the engine of your life, your soul, matches what's going on on the outside. The Corvair had a problem. Look good on the outside. Developed after the Corvette, everybody loved the Corvette, but on the inside, it had a rotten main engine seal, and all of a sudden, what was inside came out. And Peter says, don't be like that. Be noble and honorable in the following of the morals and ethics of Jesus Christ in your life, and don't let the world invade the engine of your soul. Make sure that the engine of your soul is in sync with Jesus Christ. I, I love the words of Isaiah 32, verse 8, uh, with this idea, uh, this idea of nobility and honor and uh, intrinsically good things. He says this, a noble man makes noble plans and by noble deeds he is known. A noble man makes noble plans and by noble deeds he is known honorable, being on the inside, what, what you are on the outside. Uh, even non-followers of Jesus Christ will look and they'll go, that's a sincere person who, who sincerely wants to follow Jesus Christ. And they attempt to do these intrinsically good, noble, honorable things in life. Uh, and then finally, Peter finishes off this verse and he says, in the day, on the day that God visits us. Well, what does that mean? Well, we need to understand that that word the, uh, the definite article is not there. So it's not really the day he visits us. It's whatever, whatever day he visits us, on a day that he visits us, whatever day he visits. And what Peter is saying to these followers of Jesus Christ, he's saying, 
whatever time God might show up and inspect you. You know, the reason the Romans were so good at winning the war is because they trained all the time. They were always prepared. Uh, they always were ready to march and go. They were never caught flat-footed. Uh, they were always ready to go. And what Peter says in contrast to the way the Romans are prepared to wage war and to exert power and to, uh, uh, to conquer people and subject them to their authority, we need to be ready to do noble and honorable things internally uh, so that when God shows up to inspect us, he goes, man, what they're sincerely trying to do is follow my son, Jesus Christ. So that's the end of our Bible study uh, today. So we want to ask our most important question, uh, the most important question, how do we take this 2,000-year-old material that Peter wrote, the Apostle Peter wrote this, for us, and how do we bring it forward to the 21st century and utilize it in a practical way in our lives? So we're going to look at that, but we have to ask our most important question. Are you ready? Here we go. Take a deep breath. One, two, three. So what? What difference does any of this stuff make in my life and in your life today? Well, let me give you three tests of integrity. Just three tests of integrity. The first test of integrity is the same test that the early church faced during the time of Peter, and it's called adversity. Adversity. Uh, there is a war on your soul, just like there was a war on the souls of those early Christians that, that read Peter's uh, letter. Uh, are you who you should be in Christ, even when you face adversity. See, early Christians were put to a, a huge test. Uh, are you going to say Christos Kairos, which means Caesar is the Christ? Because it was a title for Caesar. Or are you going to say Jesus Christos, Jesus is the Christ? And, and early Christians, they were put to the test. And if they said uh, Jesus Christos, oftentimes they were put to death. If they said Kairos Christos, then they were allowed to live. And so we need to understand that adversity sometimes can cause people. Well, it doesn't sometimes. It always causes people to make a choice. Adversity always costs. In fact, Jeremiah said, you know, when you're facing adversity, if you have run with footmen and they tired you out, then how are you going to compete with horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how are you going to do in the thicket of the Jordan? He says, you know, if you can't even exist as a follower of Jesus Christ in easy times, what are you going to do when things really get tough? When, when adversity sets in, when you got to compete with, instead of uh, somebody on the cross country team, you got to compete uh, with a racehorse. What's going to happen then? You need to make the decision ahead of time that I will be a person of honorable, noble, intrinsic character. I will be on the inside who I am on the outside, and I will be on the outside who I am on the inside. Proverbs says, if you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? Uh, also, Jesus said in Matthew 5, I say to you, love your adversary, love your enemy. The person that brings adversity into your life, the way to solve that problem is to love them, to serve them, to be a humanitarian toward them, to be polite to them, to listen to them, uh, to make sure that you understand the, the issue before you respond. And when you respond, respond in grace. Respond in grace. Second test of integrity is prosperity. During prosperous times, how do we conduct ourselves? The crucible, uh, Proverbs says, is for silver. The furnace is for gold. The crucible is heat, which purified the silver. The furnace is heat, which purified the gold. And a man is tested by the praise according him, accorded him. You know, what the writer of Proverbs is saying is, you know, heat is not always adversarial. It can be flattery. Uh, it can be uh, praise. How do you handle praise? Does it make you arrogant? Does it make you prideful? Look at all the great things I have done and and, and we give God no credit for what's going on in our lives. Just as adversity 
forces us to make certain choices. Prosperity forces us to make uh, some choices. Uh, you know, does prosperity in your life, uh, do you now all of a sudden uh, avoid serving God because it's going to cost you more? That's why the Bible tells us when we give to God, we give from our first fruits. If we don't give from our first fruits, if we say, well, I'll give God whatever's left over, that's a recipe for distrust. I don't really trust God. Uh, he has told me to give, but I don't because, you know, who knows when this prosperity is going to end. And we have to make decisions when we are tested by prosperity in our integrity. And the third test of integrity is accountability. Accountability. Uh, many a man proclaims his loyalty, but internally is he really a trustworthy man? A righteous man walks by his integrity. How blessed are his sons after him. It, you know, are you on the outside what you are on the inside? Are you on the inside what you are on the outside? It's a simple uh, question. Is there someone who can ask you questions? You know, is there someone who can ask you a question and, and you don't get defensive? Uh, you correct behavior when you're asked without revenge. You know, when we get what's on the inside to match what's on the outside, we have integrity. You know, the Corvair had a problem. Uh, you couldn't see it on the outside until it was too late. Once that main seal went, the Corvair was a mess. I know I had one. Uh, make sure the engine of your life is not the world, uh, but is, is the words of Jesus Christ to your heart and soul so that you can latch onto those and say, God, help me to serve you even when I face adversity, prosperity, and accountability. When I face those things, God, help me to be on the inside what I am on the outside. Help me to be on the outside what I am on the inside. And the Bible calls that integrity. So let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this day. We're thankful for your words through the Apostle Peter. Uh, we are thankful for the fact that you speak into our lives. Uh, help us Help us to have that intrinsic character, that intrinsic nobility, that intrinsic desire to honor your word with how we live and what we say and the attitudes we carry internally within us. Help our souls to be healthy uh, as we wage war against the world. Help the words of Jesus Christ to penetrate our minds and our spirits and our souls. You know, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you may be listening to this today and you have never made Jesus Christ uh, the King of your life and the Savior of your soul. And we invite you to do that today. In fact, if that's what you'd like to do, I encourage you to pray this prayer silently as I pray it out loud and say, Dear Father, thank you that Jesus Christ died on a cross and paid for all of my sins. I put my total trust and faith in him for eternal life. Help me to learn his words in the Bible that I can live with integrity. In Jesus' name. So, Father, we thank you for the book uh, that Peter wrote for us. Uh, thank you for his words and uh, the thoughts and the words that he absorbed while Jesus walked this earth that he reflects, that Peter reflects back to us. Help us to utilize them for our good and for our uh, spiritual health. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you accepted Christ this morning, we want to celebrate with you. We want to give you tools to continue in your faith journey and your relationship with Christ. And so if you would go click on our connection card on our website and you can fill that out. And there's a place to mark that I accepted Christ. And we'll be in contact with you to help you as you continue your relationship with Christ. And if you'd like to give your tithe at this time, you can do that on our app, on our iOS or Android store, on our webpage at gatewayvisalia.com in the church office, or live in person at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings out in our parking lot. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Gateway is here to invite others in, connect through relationship, develop our gifts, and serve the community. We'll see you next week.